Good morning, and thank you for joining the online service for Saponi Baptist Church in Stony Creek, Virginia. We're happy to have you with us. Please be sure to give us a like or a comment to let us know that you've been here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Merciful Father, we thank you for this time that we have together this morning with your word. Father, we thank you for how it's about to transform our lives. And Father, we just thank you for making the technology available that allows us to join together in this manner. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Our scripture this morning is John chapter 7, verses 14 through 39. Again, that's John chapter 7, starting in verse 14, picking up where we left off last week. When the festival was already half over, Jesus went up into the temple complex and began to teach. Then the Jews were amazed and said, How does he know the scripture since he hasn't been trained? Jesus answered them, My teaching isn't mine, but it's from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will understand whether the teaching is from God or if I am speaking on my own. The one who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. There is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you want to kill me? You have a demon, the crowd responded. Who wants to kill you? I did one work and you were all amazed, Jesus answered. Consider this. Moses has given you circumcision. Not that it comes from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Isn't this the man they want to kill? Yet look, he's speaking publicly, and they're saying nothing to him. Can it be true that the authorities know he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he's from. As he was teaching in the temple complex, Jesus cried out, You know me, and you know where I am from, yet I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true. You don't know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Then they tried to seize him, yet no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. However, many from the crowd believed in him and said, when the Messiah comes, he won't perform more signs than this man has done, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, so the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Then Jesus said, I am only with you for a short time. Then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said to one another, Where does he intend to go so we won't find him? He doesn't intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, does he? What is this remark he made? You will look for me, and you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been received, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. The word of the Lord, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has been preserved for us through generations of time. We thank you for how it's been carefully translated for us so that we are able to read it for our own understanding today. Father, we just ask that you will use this word to transform our minds, our hearts, and our lives. 
In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I belong to a pastor's group on Facebook. And it can be quite insightful, inspiring even, sometimes a little funny. And oftentimes it will make you think. So, um, a few weeks ago, I saw a post that, you know, really caused me to go, huh? This pastor had wrote something along the lines of, if you are not calling out false teachers, you are not doing your job. Now, my first thought is, well, that seems like a big tall order because I don't have time to listen to every preacher who has a TV program, a radio program, a book, a podcast, all this, and evaluate their teachings for you. I don't have time to see if they're telling the truth, and I don't believe that's actually my job. Now, certainly, you know, any false teachings that become big or notorious or pervasive, I always like to address those, but I cannot actually shield you from false teachings. But the best that I can do is to teach you to find the truth. So I arrived at this passage we've just read a few weeks later, and of course with the help of William Hull's commentary on the book of John, I saw that Jesus gives us three ways, and then there's a bonus mention, to tell if a teacher or what he is teaching is true. And the three things that we're going to look at, we're going to look and see if we have a collaboration of conscience, if we have a selfless ministry, and if we have a fulfillment of scriptural intention. So kind of keep those things in the back of your mind as we roll on a little bit. Now, verses 16 and 17, we read, Jesus answered them, My teaching isn't mine, but is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will understand whether the teaching is from God or if I'm speaking on my own. Now, Jesus' accusers were making the uh, note that he was not a trained rabbi. He had not gone to any of the rabbinical schools. He wasn't formally educated. Now, certainly, he was very knowledgeable, very smart, but he was not one of the seminary-educated, you know, Bible authorities, if you will. And this became a problem for them because their religious authorities were responsible for carefully passing on the traditions and keeping the teachings of the Law of Moses and all the prophets and all this thing. So they were very conscious of that. They did not want just anybody coming in with a new doctrine. Now, a modern day equivalent to this would be a pastor with, say, no seminary education. And I know these exist because, well, I was one when I came here. <laughs> am actually in the process of fixing that. But the importance is not the education. The importance is the knowledge of the truth of God's word. And so Jesus gives them a way to see if what he is saying is true. He actually gives them three ways here. But the first way we're going to look at is, you know, if, if you're looking to do God's will, if you're seeking to do God's will. Now, this is beyond what we call surface obedience, you know, where you do something because you feel like you have to, you know, sort of like when you were a kid and you would clean, you know, your room barely because your mom told you to, so you would clean everything she would see from the outside and shove everything in the closet unless she was going to look there. Surface obedience is not what's being talked about here. What is being talked about is having a true desire in your heart to obey God and serve Him. A wanting to do what God wants you to do. And that's hard to do. Sometimes we obey just, you know, just because we feel like we have to. You know, I'll give you an example. I drive on Interstate 95 a fair amount. Now, I drive 70 miles an hour 
because the law says I have to. I would much rather drive 90 miles an hour, but that would not be obedience. But my heart does not really desire to drive 70 so much. So you, you see the point I'm making here. If you truly desire to obey God, you will be equipped to do so. You know, I've had you know, numerous conversations with people who were you know, struggling to live a life that's honoring to God. And the fact is, you know, even when you want to, it can be difficult. But if you want to, God will certainly give you the ability. Your conscience will be good because you will know that what you are doing pleasing with Him. It's pleasing Him. So if you stick with surface obedience without a desire to truly obey, you're going to experience a crisis of conscience because you're going to be stuck doing things that you have no desire to do. That or you're just going to give up and just out and out sin and don't care. And, you know, this is the way of the world. But you're, the basic intent... You know, and you've heard it said before, the basic intent, if you were to boil this whole book down, is love God first and love others. So that's important. That's what he really wants us to do, and he wants us to earnestly desire to do this. And that's something you can't fake. <laughs> now, selfish motives in your obedience and in your service will leave you unable to fully enjoy God. So the second thing that Jesus teaches us to look for here is a selfless ministry. Now we can read in verse 18, the one who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now what I always say is don't just look for an action, look for a motive. Now, I'll give you an example. Jesus was not self-promoting. You know, he had been advised, as we saw last week, you know, go on to go on and make yourself known. People were looking for him to come back to Jerusalem for this festival. Make yourself known, do your miracles, you know, you'll get popular, you'll get famous. Jesus wasn't interested in that. He was interested in always pointing to his father who sent him. So beware of any pastor who consistently points to himself. Always see that as a danger sign. Many people are, you know, pastors and teachers and such are self-promoting. And you know this, you recognize it when you see it, because, well, you're smart people. You know, it, it may hit you when you hear, well, buy my book and send me some seed money. And anytime you hear the word seed money, change the channel. Or buy my envelope of water. I, I got no time for that one. Or even maybe less pernicious ways. Maybe they're more about entertainment than the gospel. Maybe the ministry is more about, you know, making you feel good than telling you what you need to hear. <clears throat> I also have uh, heard, heard it said, beware of any ministry named after the preacher that's in charge of it. You know, beware of Joe Schmo Ministries. You know, and most of the ones I listen to, I've noticed, the ones that the, the preachers that I really pay attention to, you know, it's through their church podcast or through a ministry that has a name that is not theirs. So just a thought, make of that what you will. I'm not saying that's always the case, but it is something to pay attention to. You want to make sure that who you're listening to is not self-promoting. They're promoting Jesus instead. Now, also, you need to look at what this preacher does and who benefits from it. Now, if a ministry is leading to lives transformed for Christ, it is probably okay. That's, that is usually a good sign. You know, if lives are being changed and people are being saved and people are glorifying God, it's usually a good thing. Now, if the, if the preacher continually points toward Christ and not himself, 
Yes, very good sign. He's pointing you to your need for Jesus. This is important. So be aware of those false motives. And another way that he gives us is what we call the fulfillment of scriptural intention. Now, back when I was in the Marine Corps, we used to have what was called commander's intent. You know, at the, at basically at the top of every big long order, you know, the, the commanding officer would say, you know, basically a short version of what he wants to happen without detailing all the nuts and bolts of making it happen. So you had an idea, you know, this is the outcome he expects. If you read the scripture, you will know God's intent. Now Jesus, of course being Jesus, knew that the hearts of the Jews that were confronting him weren't right. Now they were trying to kill him because he had healed a man on the Sabbath, and this particular healing we're talking about was from about eight months before this incident. But he had healed a man. Now, the Jews didn't have any problem breaking the Sabbath. They did all the time, even for something so simple as a circumcision. They would break the Sabbath. And, you know, all the, any religious thing was okay on a Sabbath. But, you know, making a man whole apparently was not allowed. Never mind that it was a miracle. They, they had a problem with this because they were not interested in how he was fulfilling the scriptures. He didn't fit their perceptions. He didn't fit their agenda. He didn't fit what they thought he should be. He had to go. And look, you know, we're going to find that the culture more and more is telling us, you don't fit our agenda, you have to go. That's the, the way of the world. But these people knew the law, but they didn't know the spirit of the law, if you will. They didn't understand that the basics, and you know, I've heard it said before, you break down the Ten Commandments. There's really only two things you have to know about them. There are how they relate to God and how to relate to other people. But these people used the law and all the 640-some things listed in the Old Testament, and then they added to them as well, so that you didn't accidentally break the law, it was more complicated than the U.S. tax code. But they were keeping people shackled instead of freeing them. Now, I'll give you an example, kind of a modern-day thing. <clears throat> Hebrews 10.25 warns against neglecting the fellowship of the meeting, you know, fellowship meetings of the church. Now, some would say that this meant you're sinning if you weren't in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I've heard that. Or, you know, every time the doors are open, there are some that have been calling us sinful for not meeting over a few weeks during the pandemic. Now, I would argue that God's command to care for the vulnerable, for the vulnerable, better filled his intent of scripture. Now, you know, that's how I interpreted it. If I was wrong, well, I'll tell you. But the only way, you know, I get to I say all this to get to this, the only way you can know if the preacher you are listening to is preaching what the scripture commands is to be in the scripture yourself. You have to be in the book. If you spend enough time in the Word, you will quickly recognize false teaching. Now, Matthew Henry said it really well. He said, only those who hate truth shall be given up to errors which will be fatal. So we've seen, of course, that Jesus told us that, he, you know, we have corroboration of conscience. That will tell us if what we're being taught is true, selfless ministry, fulfillment of scriptural intention, but then there's a bonus here. He mentions here at the very end of the passage here, verses 37 through 39, on the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit. 
For the Spirit had not yet been received, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. If anyone is thirsty, we should hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. We should, and that's what he's talking about. Now, it's interesting that Jesus said this on the last day of the feast, because one of the things that happened at the Feast of Tabernacles on that day was that they all poured water on the ground out to God. It was a celebration of the harvest and, you know, thanking God for giving the rain, the rain for the harvest and everything. So this was a big deal to come on this particular day of the festival. It would have been very simple. But like if you were standing there, now John just parenthetically mentions that Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, which was not available at that time to the audience and not available, of course, until after the ascension when Jesus goes up into heaven, and then, you know, a few days later, the Holy Spirit comes down. You know, if you've ever read Acts 2, you're aware of that. So, we got to keep in mind, too, we have a bonus. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit as our comforter and our counselor. The Holy Spirit helps us to transform our hearts and to do His will, to will to do His will. It's hard. But we have help to do that. The Holy Spirit will also help us to discern motives in others. You will pretty quickly recognize if somebody's got true motives or false motives. And the Holy Spirit gives us the courage and the strength to do God's will and His work. And to want to do God's will and His work. So... I want you to think about some things here. As we look forward to Jesus' return in glory, are you listening to him? I mean, really listening? Are you allowing him to shape your will and your actions? Is there an area of your life that you have not given up to him? And are you willing to do that today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for sending your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty that we could not pay for our sins, to die on the cross, to carry our sins to hell, and be resurrected again on the third day, and ascended up to your right hand. And Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that is available to us now. And we seek the Holy Spirit's help to go through this week. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.